Good evening. Welcome to Expert Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mantian. Here at Expert Insights, we take external views of internal successes, either in business, society, or in people's personal lives, of foreigners and expats who have made the Philippines their home. Tonight, I'm extremely honored to have a mentor of mine, a distant teacher and a guru, who is a lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management and the founder of the Society of Organizational Learning. Dr. Peter Senge. Dr. Senge, welcome to Expat Insights and welcome to Philippines. Thank you. Let's start with your life. Uh, what has brought you here at this stage? What, what made you you over the years? Lots of things. <laughs> yeah, a couple of stories from your past maybe. Well, uh, two things come yeah. to mind yeah. immediately. Uh, one is the kind of, you know, I might say the primary thread for me in my life has been always trying to understand the nature of interdependence. Mm -hmm. We often use the term system, so not always a good word to use because yeah. it sounds often too technical to people. Yeah. But um, I remember as a very young child being very aware that for me uh, there was one problem in the world. And the problem was we create this amazing web of interdependence in the world, but we don't understand it. You know, we don't really uh, appreciate the extent to which, one, we depend upon people literally all over the world. Yeah. In America, our food travels thousands of miles before we buy it. Yeah. All the people who are necessary for just something as basic as our food. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is all the people we influence. So I'm sorry? All the people we influence. Yes. Uh, just in simple daily choices. The food we buy, the cars we drive, the gadgets we plug into the wall. I mean, something as simple as charging your remote, your device. In America, most of that electricity comes from burning coal. Right. Which means that in the simple act of charging my device at night, I contribute to the diminishment of rivers throughout northern India. Because Which rivers is my country. throughout northern India, yeah. as you know, as you travel northern India, are mostly dry now much of the year mm -hmm. because there's no longer as much spring runoff because the glaciers have contracted because of climate change, because of my plugging in my device. So we're, we're living in the midst of this extraordinary interdependence but we don't really have the consciousness yet to appreciate it. So that's kind of my kind of core interest my whole life. I also grew up in Los Angeles. My best friend uh, growing up was Japanese. I spent a lot of time in a Japanese, very traditional Japanese household growing up. So I've had this lifelong interest in Asia. And I always had this idea in the second half of my life, I'd spend a lot of time in um, in the cultures of, of Eastern Asia. I just have a deep interest in Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. example. So I do come to Asia fairly often. About one month out of every year, I'm, I'm usually in China. So those are two things that kind of describe a little bit of my kind of core interests. Right. Uh, you mentioned problem of interdependence. You called it a problem. Uh, wasn't this interdependence called industrialization and civilization several thousands of years ago? Were we not proud of this when we put together these systems where we could buy something from far off lands and use them. Wasn't we, we were proud of this at one right. time. Right. Yeah, I think you would call that progress. That in time, some ways. way back then, right. yeah. Well, probably still today. I mean, if you don't have access to the sorts of goods and services that we would have access to in a richer country, you would say we're not as developed. And becoming more developed is a sign of progress. But it's a limited type of progress. The side effects of that progress may turn out to be as important or more important than the progress itself. So climate change would just be one example. But in fact, it could very well be that even the bigger effect of burning so much fossil fuels to support this interdependent economy yeah. is the dissolving of that carbon dioxide in the world's oceans, which is the acidification of oceans, mm -hmm. which is destroying uh, coral reefs around the world, which destroys 
uh, fishing ecosystems, right. uh, marine ecosystems around the world, and ultimately our life on land depends on the health of marine ecosystems. So that's a big, complex side effect. What part in your life, you said you grew up in an American and a Japanese culture, and now you're influenced by it. When exactly did you make that choice? Was there, was there a certain moment in your life you said, okay, this is what I want to do, here's my purpose. What was your life before that realization? And of course, we know the life after that one. Was there any... No, I don't uh, think there was any particular moment. Uh, I think I've been very fortunate because just the way, the kind of course of my life, um, I'm more or less continually immersed in, in very reflective environments. So I think I've had so many awakenings to kind of what do I really care about? What's my sense of purpose? And, and there are, you know, it's been to me more of a steady progression. There have been particular moments where aspects of that progression became perhaps particularly clear. Mm -hmm. I remember one incident. I used the term a little while ago, the second half of my life. Yeah. Um, and I had gone to a, uh, a particular place in central Colorado. I had a friend who told me, at some point, you should go to this area. It's called the Flat Tops Wilderness. Flat Tops Flat Wilderness. Flat Tops, because yeah. it's basically a set of, 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 of a geological configuration mm -hmm. where you go very, very high up, like you're in the mountains, but all of a sudden you realize you're on these plateaus. Right. And it's called the Flat Tops. And I'll never forget the first time I went up there. I love the mountains. I spent a lot of time in the mountains. But there's a little part of yourself, I think, that's never quite relaxed because you can't live there, right? You get up high in the mountains, yeah. on a mountain peak or a coal, a little notch or something, and it might be really exhilarating because you see so far and you have this sense of elevation. Right. But at least for me, I realized that afternoon I never was completely relaxed because you can't survive there. You know, it's not a friendly place, the top of a mountain. It's an exhilarating, uplifting place, but it's not really friendly. You get to the top of the flat tops and you can see the day, the world. first day I went up, uh, you could see 100 miles in all directions. It was just right. incredibly long. Right. 360 degrees, all right. directions. Right. But you're in pasture. Beautiful, expansive. Oh, it's, not dro it's not rock. It's not, not rock. It's grass. Okay. You feel it's very weird because you're simultaneously very high and you see a long distance, but you feel like you would feel in a, in a river valley. Very relaxed. Very lush. Very lush. Yeah. Very kind of welcomed. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first feeling. And then I spent time walking around, and it was a very extraordinarily beautiful day, very blue sky, and big white clouds that you could almost touch because you were so high up. The clouds were very, very close. So I was just really enjoying these extraordinary, um, almost uh, anachronistic experiences, being very high up and yet feeling down in the valley. Being in the middle yeah. of the sky and almost touched the clouds. They were so close. Yeah. And so um, it was one of those moments. And in that moment, in an instant, yeah. I had this awareness that my life was at this middle point. And that everything I had done up until that point has been to prepare for the second half of my life. And I've never had that experience before. And that created that fear and excitement at the same time. And just real clarity. It was oh. real moment of clarity. And, and then in, in that instant, I just knew what the second half of my life was all about. It was very, very simple and very clear. Um, and in some ways, as I said, it had built on everything else. Yeah. So I had this sense of I had been preparing, preparing, preparing. Now I would actually start to do the, the future work. lies ahead, yeah. And, and what I was preparing for yeah. was very clear and that I had one purpose and that was to help in the reconnection of human and nature. All right, Dr. Senge, we've got to take a break here because we paused the cameras for the 10-minute break. Uh, after, we after we come back from the break, I'll talk, I'll talk to you about systems thinking. 
and your new book, The Necessary Revolution. So thank you for being again with us on Expand Insights. That's Peter Senge. That's an introduction. We'll come back after the break. I'm your host, Rajuman here. Stay with us. Welcome back to Expand Insights. I'm your host, Rajuman here, and we are still with Dr. Peter Senge of the fifth discipline, fame, and now of the necessary revolution. So he just shared with us a story about his past and how he has become who he is today. Uh, Dr. Senge, I'd like to ask you about the book, the first one, the fifth discipline that uh, puts across the concept of system thinking. Yeah? And you wrote this 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. So uh, quickly for my audiences in the Philippines, what is systems thinking? Well, systems thinking is uh, seeing the world as a web mm -hmm. of interdependence. Right. And pay, learning to pay attention not only to the web, but you might say the flux, the continual evolving nature mm. of the world. And see, in this sense, it's, an, it's a new kind of scientific term for a very old idea. What is the old idea? That we live in a web. Mm -hmm. of interdependence. Right. And that while you and I may appear to be objects, right. and at one level our consciousness produces the awareness of Rajan over there, Peter over here, right, at another level, at all kinds of physical, emotional, spiritual interdependence, we are the conversation. Right. The conversation is a dance for right. the two of us too. Mm. And literally even at the physical level there's all this exchange right, of energy. There's a movement of hands, yeah? Exactly. So uh, that's all that systems thinking is pointing out. So it's a set of tools and methods that to some degree have their roots in modern science. But the sensibility, the awareness is very old. The sense of it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, well, how knowing system thinking, understanding system thinking, how would uh, companies, individuals, organizations be able to use it? How can they make fruitful use of it? Sure. Uh, well, first off, I think good managers yes. always are struggling with this dilemma, you might say. On the one hand, they have results, they have targets, they have things they're trying to accomplish. On the other hand, they're trying to grow the capabilities of their organization, of people, of teams, in order to accomplish. I always think that managerial work is these two aspects. One part we all talk about, but the other part often sits in the background. And good managers, not all managers, but good managers, are, are very aware that they're trying to always develop people, mm -hmm. individually, collectively. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where systems thinking can be very useful. Mm -hmm. So s systems thinking says that, well, it's not just the decision we made, it's the quality of the conversation that we just had. Did it really strengthen our sense of trust in each other? Did right. it build a sense of mutual understanding? Yeah. Because that trust and understanding will be actually critical to whether or not the decision ever leads to action that produces the results we really say we want to produce. Right. Uh, so, from a systems perspective, you're always paying attention, you might say, to the subtle as well as the manifest. Would that be the grain of the relationship, the fine grain of relationship? Yes, exactly. Would that be the thing? So, if I exactly. want to build something, it's not just the bricks and the bars and the steels, but the finer grain which is unseen. Yeah, exactly. So, I'd have to mind and watch that yes. to be able to build what I want yes. to build. That would be it. Yes. Uh, all right. In the book, in the book, you also talk about four disciplines before the discipline of systems thinking. Uh, would you like to name them? Uh, sure. The first one being mental models, of course. What is mental models to an individual and to an organization? What is a mental model? Well, when we started to work with this whole systems perspective, we started to realize pretty quickly that it was one aspect of an interrelated set of developments. So there is no system in the sense of a, an external object. There's a flux and a web. There's yeah. a flux and a web. Yeah. But there's also our awareness at any point in time. And that awareness often has inherent flaws in it. We see a thing, but we forget that what we see is really at some level a projection. Hmm. An illusion? You can say project. that. Yeah in the sense that 
reality is always more than my awareness of the reality. So what emerges in my awareness is uh, maybe a snapshot or a fragment or something that I'm particularly attuned to. So I'm a man, I see some things, a woman sees something else. I may be trained as an engineer, I see some things. Someone who's trained as a salesperson sees something else. So in that sense, we're always seeing these partial views. That's not um, a very radical idea. Mm -hmm. The important point is we forget. Mm -hmm. And we think that what we see is. So the discipline of mental models is to remind us to reflect. Mm. Now, uh, so at what stage in my being, in my beingness, would I know that I'm not creating the picture that I'm looking at? In the book you mentioned the eye does not see the eye. So at what point in my life or in my beingness, in my existence, will I know that, hey, I have stopped looking out from an eye or a view that I have created. How will I know? When will I stop? When, if I go back several sections, I check myself, I check myself, and you say I become highly aware of it. When do I stop, since if it, if it is all illusion? Well, this is where the, the discipline of reflection, practically speaking, has to be both individual and collective. So the simplest uh, way I think about that is that that's why working together is really important. Mm. Because if you think about it, in our interactions with one another, we're continually engaged with people who don't quite see the same thing we see. Right. But normally we're busy trying to manage or manipulate the other which, which, which so that we'll agree. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to being just curious. Gee, that's really interesting, Roger. Why do you see that that way? Yeah. In that instant, there's a possibility that your seeing and my seeing can have a dance. Right. And I'll start to see something I didn't see. Yeah. I'll become aware of the limits of my own seeing. So that brings us to the next uh, discipline, which is when I see something and I see it from behind my eyes until you agree and acknowledge, and I say we both see the same thing, then maybe we can accept that as something objective. So shared vision, would that become a shared vision? Um, maybe. Um, so shared vision really is pointing to our aspiration. Now, the word vision has two different meanings, yeah. right? It's, it's what I see, but it's also my what, dream. What I foresee out in well, the Well, it's not so much foresee, it's what I desire. Oh, what I desire, hope, yeah. You know, so what is it that I really would like to see? Right. What do I want to see exist? So again, the word vision has a couple of different meanings. Yes. But in that sense, vision is a picture or image of the future that you seek to have exist. So it's my vision for my life. It's my vision for my company. It's my vision for whatever. Um, so we use the term shared vision to represent when people collectively start to paint a similar picture of a future they want to create. That's a little different than the more the use of vision in terms of my awareness. Okay. That collective uh, awareness really comes much more out of the process of dialogue right. and team learning. Yeah. That, you know, when I'm open to what you see and what you see and what I see is not the same, but it's different aspects of reality, we start to engage in a process of cultivating a collective awareness which is always more than my individual awareness. So we use this term um, uh, team learning dialogue to point to the second and shared vision to point to the common aspiration. Yeah, I, I think maybe I didn't kind of phrase myself right. What I was saying is that when you and I see, you, you present something, you project something out of your own perspectives, then I agree to it, that kind of becomes a collective awareness, then moves on to being a shared vision. Was I off when I assumed that? Yeah, we, I would use the terms a little differently. And obviously, Collect language yeah. is just a set of devices we use to yeah. uh, achieve some shared understanding. So uh, it's not that you're using those words in a way that I think is, is not consistent with the dictionary. <laughs> it's just not consistent with the particular definitions that we tend From to the use. From the book. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and that's because we're just trying to make some distinctions. Yeah. There's reality yeah. and there's vision. We make the distinction of the vision is what we would like reality to become, yeah. and reality is more our awareness of what is. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're both very important, equally important, because in the creative process, 
I have to learn how to become more and more grounded in the reality in which I'm operating. And simultaneously, I have to continue to cultivate my sense of what I really want to see happen. So my aspiration and my reality are equally critical to the creative process. Wow. Now, uh, that brings me to one of the other disciplines, which is mastering these two processes, the collective awareness and the dialogue. How do I go about it? When do I uh, know that I'm good at this or I'm becoming good at this? Oh, that's really simple. Um, you, you judge by what you create. And that's a measurable output? Or that's well, it's a manifestation. It's a manifest yeah. output. Yeah. How quantitative it is, you know, is, is, a, is, a dis, is another uh, distinction. But, you know, how do I know I'm a good painter? Well, by the paintings I produce. How do I know I'm a good parent? Well, by the children I contribute to in their manifestation. How do I know I'm good at anything? I just look at what manifests around me. It's, an, it's a very tough standard because in our kind of imagination, we'd all like to think we may be more advanced than we are. But then I look at what gets manifest. I mean, and it's humbling. I mean, it's, it's but natural that we always believe we are more advanced than we are. Uh, Doc, uh, individually, maybe I work at myself, improving my awareness and being, uh, becoming aware of what I'm doing and also managing my dialogue. How do I transfer this? How do I let it flow out in my groups, in my organizations? How do I teach them? If teach is the right word, how do I make this a living thing, the aspect of mastery in an organization? Well, it's a, it's a tricky uh, domain because obviously if I'm a manager, if I'm a teacher, if I'm someone who really is engaged in work where I really want to see the influence on others, mm -hmm. that's one of the most basic aspects of my work. You know, how are other people changing? On the other hand, as a human being, I can't change you. So two aspects. Number one, I must want to see the change and then I can't change it. All right? It's a real dilemma. Yeah. yeah I think in many ways um, you could look at teaching as a, both a metaphor and an illustration. So on the one hand, I would maintain that teachers can't teach anybody anything. People can only learn. Mm -hmm. Right? And learning is always a personal process where a learner has to do something and over time, a certain capability develops. That's what we call learning. Yeah. Learning to walk. On the other hand, it's obvious that somebody, some people are very good teachers. So I think that, that we kind of have to step into this dilemma and, and appreciate both. One human being cannot cause another human being, I think, ultimately to grow and develop. On the other hand, some people seem to be really good at creating an environment Mm -hmm. or a set of conditions whereby others more reliably grow and develop. Mm -hmm. We call those people great teachers. Uh, so, as far as I can see, the only way to understand this dilemma is that I don't try to cause you to change. I just be the way I am. And in my embodying of something, let's say it's a capability <coughs> that you would like to develop yourself, you start to get a feeling for what's involved. You may also be inspired by what you feel or see in the other. Yeah. And out of those two, you're kind of feeling for it, and your inspiration to be like that, you might learn. So it's the mystery whereby one person actually influences another without manipulation. We often are trying to manipulate each other. Usually when we're doing that, we slow down the learning. Yeah. Because it's not fundamentally respectful. And people who do not feel respected close down. It's not fruitful also in the systems. Doc, uh, I want to go back a bit and I want to understand this. Uh, personal mastery and awareness. No? Now, when we talk about sharing this learning with the team or influencing them in any which way, there's also an internal dialogue that I engage in myself. Call it awareness. Right. So, uh, awareness is fine. It's, it's fine to say become a little more aware. But what do I tell myself? What do I how do I turn inwards and tell myself? What are the things I will do day by day, again and again, so that I know that 
another part of me is learning just like I'm creating the learning for somebody else outside how do I recreate the learning for myself what steps would I take because uh, the essence probably is personal mastery individual mastery then the group I guess, yeah I yeah, do yeah. think that's that's very accurate yeah because the reason I say that when I look at the people who I regard as being quite masterful yeah. as managers just the way you're talking about I'm using the word manager I mean in the yeah. very broadest sense though yeah. people who can only accomplish things through getting other people to accomplish things yeah. right and uh, kind of the operational definition of a manager somebody who can be held right. accountable for results produced by other people yeah so this this process of influence is, is a very in, in, integral to being an effective manager and my experience is the ones who are the best at it are extremely committed to their own growth and development and they're doing that in order that they can be good at being a good manager so how do they do it well they learn to pay attention they learn to openly seek the, f the feedback from others. So the feedback loop, yeah. Probably the simplest way to, to explain this is to illustrate it. I have a good friend who I regard as a real master manager. He worked for years uh, in Ford Motor Company. I think he was maybe Ford's best, certainly one of their best who executive this, managers. Though? His name was Roger Salant. Mm -hmm. uh, he eventually headed up all the electronics businesses for uh, the part of Ford that he worked in. In any event, um, he consistently was able to produce remarkable results to other people. And he would always say, it all starts with your commitment to personal mastery. Right. So I think the first part of your question is, is a subtle but, but simple one. Are you really serious? So it's also... Are you really committed? Boils down to intention. Do you really have the intention really to grow and develop as a human being? We all say yes, of course. If I say, yeah. you know, do you want to grow and develop? Everybody says yes. But then you watch what you do. For example, when Roger was implementing uh, what they call 360s, it's a technique in you see common in business yeah. where every manager asks the people above them as well as below right. them yeah, to rate them. <laughs> okay, it's called 360 degree feedback. So when he was first implementing that in his company, a big division of, uh, of Ford, um, he did it for himself. And he would do this every year. He would get people around him, so above him, and board members, okay? Because he was the CEO of a division. Um, and people below him, people at the same level as him, uh, other general managers. He would go through that process, and then he would conclude with one or two things that were the most important for him to work on to develop. Right. He would then share those with every single person in the organization. Yeah. And so at that time, if I remember that organization, there were two or three thousand people. This is how many years ago? Oh, this is probably 15 years ago when I watched him go through this. Um, two or three thousand people all knew what their boss was working on to grow and develop as a human being. And well. he would say, you know, I need help. I'm not very good at this. Wow. I would like all of you to feel free to tell me anything you think would be useful to me you see in my own behavior wow. that would help me wow. grow and develop in this way. So you say, wow, because we realize that's not no, the sort that's, of thing that's, a boss that's, does. That's, that's noble. That's, that's very noble. Yeah. So here's the boss yeah. asking everybody to help him become a better listener because yeah. he realized that that was something he needed to develop. Right, right. So that's what I mean by being really committed. Doc, we need to take that break. Yeah? Uh, we still have to cover one more model, sure. one more discipline, so we'll come back after this break. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are still with Dr. Peter Senge, and we're still on just the fourth discipline, so we haven't gone. We're still on three. We still have to go to the fourth one, and we'll go on that one right after the break. I'm your host, Raju Mandian. Please stay with us. Good evening. Welcome back to Expat Insights. I'm still with Dr. Peter Senge, and he's looking at me very, very intently because I have not covered the fourth discipline from his book, The Fifth Discipline, which he wrote 20 years ago. Doc, could you just go back and talk a bit about the fourth discipline, which is team learning? First off, one of the first ideas we shared in that book, The Fifth Discipline, is that teams always exist and that all real work in organizations is done by teams. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, well, what do you mean by a team? Yeah. So and there's maybe official teams, but a lot of people say, well, I'm not a member of a team. I just do my work at my desk. Right. But that's never quite accurate. Yeah. 
it's really hard to find anything that gets accomplished in any organization by one person in isolation. Mm -hmm. So there's official teams and then there's the reality of the real team. So a simple question is, in order to get done what I get done, in order to make the accomplishment that I contribute to, who else has to be part of it? That's a question we often ask people. And they think about it, they go, oh, well, yeah, well, if so-and-so didn't do such and such, then I wouldn't have this. And then, so you start to reveal that all the work gets done through teams. And then the real question is, well, how do those teams get better at doing what they want to do? Mm -hmm. It's learning. Yeah. So team learning is simply the process whereby people who need one another to get something done actually enhance their capacity to get it done. That's so in, in a sense, it's, it's an accum accumulation of the first three disciplines put together to a larger event. Yeah, and, and that's one of the problems. You know, we always say the five disciplines are an interdependent set. Yeah. So it's always discovering how they connect. So what you said is yeah, absolutely just, correct. Just one big point. Uh, Dr. Senge, yesterday you did a convention here called the Learning Revolution yeah, with uh, lots of Filipino speakers. One of them was Judge Monet Singh. Monet Singh is a lady of 40-something and she has changed the face of the regional trial court in Quezon City. And the, she had 4,500 pending cases when she got the job and today she is ahead of the job. There is no pending cases in her court. So she, what she did was she changed the, the situation, the environment of the court and she did this by will, the intention that you talk about. So she created from your theory the, a virtual circle, yeah, a positive one. So she forced something that was already working and was system, systemic. Now is it possible that systems thinking being multidimensional at a certain uh, portion, a certain distance away in time horizon, as you call it, could that virtual circle eventually create a vicious circle? And how would I know, how would I manage that far away in a different dimension of space and time? Well, in some ways you can never know, right? Yeah. We're, we don't have perfect foresight ever. But I think that it all starts with understanding how she brought about the change in the first place. It was really simple. Uh, because she was very concerned about this condition of all these pending cases. Mm -hmm. And then she had an insight. The insight she had was that judges actually don't pay any attention to this. Judges see their job as handling the trial right in front of them. They're the judge. Somebody else manages the caseload. Right. And she said, that's a real problem. I should take responsibility for the whole of the system. Hmm. And I should be thinking about the management of the caseload as well as what's the best way to adjudicate this case. Right. So, in a sense, in a very simple way, she redefined her job. She redefined her job. She redefined her job. Just like Roger did from Ford. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. She shifted her sense of responsibility to a larger part of the system, not just the case adjudication in isolation. Now, what could be some of the unintended side effects of that? The, the long term, yeah. The long term. Yeah. You could have, you know, well, one thing is you could have judges who see that they have to do everything and they don't work in collaboration with the clerks right. who are supposed to be managing the caseload. So that could be an unintended side effect. There always will be unintended side effects, things that we don't see. The real question is do we have some discipline of thinking about that? So just to illustrate, mm. if I'm concerned about that, yeah. I would be concerned that judges might take too big a sense of responsibility. They wouldn't work collaboratively with the clerks as opposed to, remember she kept saying, well, we're a team, we're a team. I'm going to take a broader sense of responsibility, but I don't want to undermine the clerks. I want the clerks to feel equally responsible. Yeah. So that would be a perfect example thinking ahead about the possible unintended side effects and taking responsibility for those as well. Dr. Senge, uh, it, it would also be possible that some of the judges might react violently to that. Not just take up more uh, responsibility but say, hey, you are changing the status quo here and we're going to get after you. So would that, how would that matter? There would be another example. You could be a threat. Yeah. A lot of innovators accomplish something important 
but they also create a lot of threat mm -hmm. for people who are in similar positions who say, whoa, 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 I don't think I'm ready for that. Yeah. So to deal with that unintended side effect, you have to say, well, how do I reach out to other judges so that I can help them see that this could be beneficial for them mm -hmm. as well? So she would think that far oh, into yeah. space and time. I, there's an old saying in the uh, Confucian tradition in uh, traditional Chinese philosophy that ignorance is actually a sin. Now you think about that, then we're always sinning because we're always ignorant. But I think the real message is you continually work, you continue work, you never give up. You always keep trying to think of the next thing you are unaware of and work on that. Learning systems, learning systems, learn. learned waters. Uh, Doc Senge, thinking and action, difference between the two, if any. So I think and I, I see things, my awareness is high, my choices become much more pure. When do I get up and go? And if I get up and go, uh, is it going to create a reverse effect on what, how I thought? Well, I, I think language is useful and language is dangerous. Uh, so, let me say this, try to say this in a little different way. Yes, sir. You're never not acting. Or? And you're never not thinking. Fantastic. They're always equally present. Right. So, you know, someone says, well, I'm meditating now. I say, well, that's an action. That's an action characterized by not moving your body. But it's an action. Right, right. Uh, so, like, people who think, well, my goal of meditation is to have no thoughts. Well, then you're dead. If you have no thoughts, you're dead. <laughs> you're a block of wood. Human right. beings always have a flow of thought. Yeah. So, you're always thinking and you're always acting. And the real question is, are you paying attention to either so or the both? the quality of both. And then the, the thinking and acting become more harmonious. So there's a wonderful term for this uh, that a, a, a great teacher at MIT came up with many years ago. He called it a reflective practitioner. A reflective oh, practitioner nice yeah, nice is someone thing. who is practicing, they're acting, but they're simultaneously cultivating the Observing awareness and to observe themselves in action. Dr. Senge, uh, we have a few minutes left for this interview. Uh, two things that I want to bring up. Number one is that somewhere between the fifth discipline and the fifth discipline field book, you mentioned that books, management books are not necessary and you might not write another one. And yesterday in Fully Book, I saw several books with your name on it. Can you explain that? <laughs> Well, uh, quite a few of those books were joint projects. Okay. So, like, there's a whole series of field books. I maybe I write uh, a couple of pieces, but there's a whole team that produces them. And everybody's t conclusion is they put my name in big because it sells more. Yeah. It's purely I, practical. I'll, 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 I'd like that opportunity someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very nice, you know. Yeah. So, a team works together, which I really enjoy. Yeah. Uh, and then they put my name a little more prominent. But yeah. in those books, we all divide up all the profits equally. Okay, that's good. Um, and the same was true of the book Presence. Presence was many of us working together. We yeah. all divided the profits, and they put my name at the top. Okay? It's just practical. So if the people want to sell more of the books, they do whatever helps sell more of the books. Yeah. Um, I also, um, I do, I am very critical about management books. I think there's a lot of management books, and most of them aren't very helpful. You're also critical about the words vision and sustainability. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I... You know, we, we do what we do because we think it can be helpful. It doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, so, I, I, I'm always, my biggest interest is the outcomes. You know, what's accomplished. I don't really care about books as books. Are they useful? That's the only thing that I really care about. You, you mentioned it somewhere. I, I was looking at your notes. It says, it's not the vision says, but what the vision does to you. So, you, it's what it does to you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Senge, two more questions before you close. One is beyond what you have put out into the world today, the fifth discipline and now the necessary revolution. And this is from where you are today. Is there something that you think might appear on the horizon of learning? Beyond learning, something like forgiving or compassion or love. C can there be something much more bigger than this discipline in the future? And from where you stand, what could that be possibly? Well, obviously, we're all very limited in what we can see beyond our seeing. Right, it's sir. a tricky question. What do you see that you don't see? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, well, juggle a few things, you know, look in different directions and time and... Well, I, yeah, you kind of look around the world and you say, yeah. what are some of the big problems in the world? And, you know, I think that an area that um, is very undeveloped, and I'm not the person who's going to develop it, is the difference between, let's say, the masculine and the feminine yeah. uh, approaches to leadership. Yeah. Um, when I was working on the Necessary Revolution, uh, we're talking to a lot of different people, and I realized a disproportionate number of the people who were the most effective leaders right. were actually women. Okay. And that was just the data. That was just the facts. And we, it was so compelling that the Sustainability Consortium, the network of organizations, out of which most of the stories in the Necessary Revolution arose, many people started to notice that a disproportionate number of the most successful innovations were led by women and a group formed called Women Leading Sustainability. Well, they had to reflect themselves on what was distinctive about their worldview and their consciousness, their way of leading, much more network-oriented ways of leading, much less, you know, drive to results. So there's so many things like that. That would be one, though, that would come to my mind. Dr. Senge, thank you very much for this interview. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And uh, I didn't ask you this. What are you doing in the Philippines? And do you want to say that to the camera? And sure. is there something that you want to tell to your friends in the Philippines? So, uh, right well, there. Well, when, when I go to uh, a country to the, to like the Philippines, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm always there because I'm there to support people doing this work in their country. There's a wonderful network of people here called the Society for Organization Learning in the Philippines. SOL. Yeah. So, Philippines, uh, they're working with businesses, with schools, working on sustainability issues. And the purpose of my visit is to support them. And through supporting them, I hope to support the people in the Philippines. So, you know, it's a simple rule of thumb. It's a really good guidance system, I would suggest to all of us. Support people who support people. Okay. Mabuhay, I see you. Thank you. And God bless, him. God bless you and you will. Thank you for this interview, Dr. Senge. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for watching Expand Inside. That was Dr. Peter Senge of... MIT Sloan and I'm your host Raju Mandian. Good night and good luck.